Well, I think if we're just uh, speaking technically about it, we are at the end of the American-led world by, by fact, uh, not, not even by these disastrous blunders, but simply by the fact that other countries, and of course, most notably China, but not China alone, has very talented, well-educated, skilled uh, people with a, a strong infrastructure and strong technology. So a country, the U.S., with 4.1 percent of the world population should never presume to run the world or to write the rules. We are intrinsically in a multipolar world. <clears throat> But the whole idea of neoconservatism in the United States, and that's the government we have right now, and it's bipartisan, it's Democrats and Republicans, is that <clears throat> the U.S. is the unique unipolar country, and it must resist any potential competitors, most importantly China, and Russia is viewed as a you know, more minor regional threat. It's mind boggling, but that is the literal view of Victoria Newland. It is the view of her husband, Robert Kagan, who writes these books that are shocking in their naivete, uh, like The Jungle Grows Back, the whole theme of which is the world's a jungle, the US is a garden, and it's the job of the United States to stop the jungle. It's gross. That's actually, <laughs> I'm telling you, that is the guiding principles. And Canada, please think clearly. Come on. You guys are better than that. Really. So please act better than that. Don't just follow the U.S. line into this these uh, wars of def trying to defend hegemonic power. The next one will be in over Taiwan. That could end all of it. Even this one can end all of it. Today we took what seems to be another horrible step of escalation. If it's true, who knows whether it's true or not true, but I was just watching the video that uh, the Russian government has posted of Ukrainian drones uh, uh, intercepted over the Kremlin. If this is right, are we kidding? And I wrote to leading journalists because they said the Financial Times wrote this afternoon. I can't even make sense of it. It said, uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it because it's so, so indicative of, of, the, of the crazy mindset. Uh, Oh my God. Yeah, it, it, well, they changed it from when I read it this morning. Now it says, if confirmed, the apparent attempt on Putin's life and the acknowledgement from the Kremlin would mark an extraordinary admission of Russian vulnerability. Instead of saying, oh my God, <laughs> are we really going to have World War III? It was taken all day by the Financial Times all afternoon is, well, look at this. What is, you know, this is Russian vulnerability. There are no grown-ups right now in our governments or in the media that parrot our governments. It's, I've never, honestly, I'm 68. I've been through the Vietnam War, through the Gulf Wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, Serbia, Syria, countless CIA overthrows of governments. I've never seen anything like we're seeing right now. And it may be because of this desperation of the U.S. of uh, somehow seeing its hegemonic rule questioned, or it may be that they've lost their minds out of decades of arrogance. I don't know what it is. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, commentary. Um, we're going to move on to the next uh, journalist, um, Alex Koch from The Maple. Um, Alex, are you there? Hello. 
Can Hello? Hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Um, this is a question for Professor Sachs. Um, to your point, uh, or to your, your plea for Canada to, to, to see reason and to uh, push for negotiations and diplomacy, my question is, like, do you think that even if Canada wanted to do that, it, that it would make an impression on the United States and NATO more generally? Does Canada have the clout to actually make a difference on this issue? Canada, together with other countries, certainly could help the United States to see reality. So uh, if Canada and France, who I know looks askance at this, but dares not say so many times, though once in a while Macron lets something out, uh, uh, Germany, India, Brazil, China, <laughs> everybody knows that this is a disaster, but nobody tells the US. And a actually a European prime minister said to me a year ago, I said, why don't you say something? And he said, because they treat us like children. A, a prime minister of a major European country said that to me. It still makes my skin crawl. I don't know why they allow themselves to be treated like children. The United States is not all powerful. It's can't even, it, it can't put one foot ahead of the next one these days. So there's actually no reason but to say, you know, this isn't working so well. We, we actually need to think through this before the world gets blown up. And there is no strategy on this because Ukraine could lose on the battlefield. And if it wins, it gets destroyed. This is, and, and all we're told, the only thing we're told, Biden had one minute of honesty a year ago. He said, we're on a path to Armageddon. All the newspapers immediately rose up in unison and said, don't talk like that. Don't ever say that again. We're not, we're not allowed to say that. It's, it's unbelievable. So yes, Canada can make a difference, but not by itself. But the fact of the matter is a lot of leaders know this, but one by one, they're scared. Thank you, Jeffrey. Alex, um, did you have a follow up or? Yeah, kind of related to that. Um, I mean, obviously this, this conflict has resulted in new members of NATO being added. So in the short term, it looks like, you know, NATO is uh, stronger in a, in a sense as a result of this war. But in the long term, do you think this war will uh, actually weaken NATO standing in the international community or will it continue to, to, to grow in your opinion? Well, the, the most important thing is to define the international community. The international community is the US, Canada, Britain, the European Union, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Those are the countries that are aligned with the US. The rest of the world is nowhere near this. The attitude of the rest of the world is, holy shit, what are you guys doing? And you're killing us in the interim because we actually have a lot of hungry people. Uh, we have a lot of problems. You've disrupted the whole world economy. And so remember that it's 20% of the world is the international community, according to the United States. We and then they can't understand. Oh, how could Lula say this? How could Lula go to China? How could the Saudis say this? They don't understand anything about the world that I live in, which is the other 80% of the world watching this. The other 80% of the world ain't impressed, believe me. And they're not standing up and rooting for the United States. And what we consider 
the world or sometimes called the West, which is a term I hate for basically because it's such a bad term to describe this, but it is essentially the North Atlantic countries that have been the dominant countries for the last two centuries, plus the honorary members, uh, Japan uh, and, uh, and Korea, um, and the Anglo-Saxon offshoots, so-called, of Australia and New Zealand. That's it. And uh, they don't understand that the rest of the world actually has other concerns and doesn't want to back a NATO expansion war and doesn't want to live under the threat of nuclear annihilation because of the unwillingness of Ottawa and Washington to negotiate over NATO enlargement. Thank you. So we're at the top of the hour now. I'm going to try and squeeze in. We have one last journalist, um, Aidan from the Canada Files. Are you there? Um, we'll, we'll have to be a little bit brief as uh, we've come pretty much to the end of our time. But uh, Aidan, please do ask your question. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you. Uh, Aidan Jonah, Editor-in-Chief of Canada Files. So I have a question for Mr. Sox, so uh, the Capitals recently, we interviewed uh, Dimitri Laskaris, who is on a uh, fact-finding trip to Russia, and also Canadian Tamara Lorenz uh, also went on a fact-finding trip to Russia a few months before that. What are your thoughts on the value of fact-finding trips to Russia and understanding their perspective with this conflict? As a general matter, I'm in favor of all possible discussion and outreach of various kinds, uh, whether it's uh, academics or cultural uh, or sports. I, I don't want to see Russia boycotted in the Olympics. I find all of this idea of dividing the world to be extraordinarily dangerous. And the idea that we don't talk to our counterparts to be extraordinarily dangerous. For me, you know, fact finding is fine and good. In fact, not just fine, but <laughs> picking Biden, picking up the phone and speaking with President Putin wouldn't be bad. You know, even if they didn't agree, talk, have a Zoom together, hear each other's points of view. But that would require the maturity of maybe a 17 year old, I don't know, but these are kids. These are children, the way they behave. And it's all bullying, shouting, taunting, humiliating, not talking. So this is incredible. When did Prime Minister Trudeau last speak to, to uh, President Putin? And why not? Canada's got big stakes in this. Is it just we repeat whatever propaganda we want or do we talk to each other? Hear the ideas. That is my biggest recommendation of all. Talk. And why is it that the United States uh, was so provocative, has been so provocative towards Russia? You know, because after the end of the Soviet Union, we thought, hey, we're pretty good. We're, we're the sole superpower. We're, uh, we're, we're the uh, most powerful country on the planet by far in world history. We can do pretty much what we want. And that really was the view in both political parties. So it's not really a partisan thing. It, it is what we call a neoconservative thing. It was the idea that, hey, we, we can whoop who we want when we want, whether it's Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, we can stick it to uh, Vladimir Putin. We are the United States of America. And uh, we acted on that. We had, remember, Cheney and Rumsfeld and that crowd? Well, we have them in both parties. We, we have Victoria Newland in, in this administration who was out there helping to overthrow a pro-Russian president of Ukraine in 2014, and now she's the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs. So we have these neocons who say, compromise? Are you kidding? We're the United States. And since we think we're so powerful, well, 
We're in Afghanistan. That's great. Syria, Iraq, Libya, uh, Ukraine. Oh, so successful. And I say, are you kidding? My whole life, uh, you know, I was born a long time ago in 1954. I grew up in the Vietnam War period. And it wasn't just Vietnam. It was Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. I went through the Contras and Nicaragua. I went through Afghanistan, the first Iraq War, the second Iraq War. The CIA operation to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, the, the NATO operation to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi. Now the, the uh, U.S. role in overthrowing Viktor Yanukovych, the pro-Russian Ukrainian president in 2014, this expansion of NATO being tried right now. I just think yeah, we're, we're powerful, but is this really good for the United States? Is this really working? Uh, and my answer is no, uh, it's not working well. And most of all, when Putin said last year, look, the red line is don't expand NATO. And immediately the White House said, oh, no one tells us what to do, least of all Russia. And I called the White House and I said, you know, you should listen. Do not put Russia, do not put Ukraine into this situation. You will make Ukraine, the Afghanistan of Europe. And by that, I mean a perpetual war and leveling these cities in Ukraine as we're watching right now. And millions of people without heat and electricity. And we say, yeah, we're winning. Come on, we're not winning. This is not the right way to behave. And who did you speak to at the White House and how was it received? I, it was uh, not well received uh, and uh, I didn't make any headway. Right. Was it, I mean, I, it, well, did you speak to Biden himself? No. No. Okay. You spoke I, to, I, I spoke to advisors. Yeah. You're someone who has a lot of access. And although it's probably been changing because you've been saying things that are considered heretical. Um, they, they don't love what I'm saying. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I don't know whether I mean, they still they still hear me. Right. <laughs> so it's But it's pretty much one way. Um, right. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, have you, have you, do you think that you've changed your politics or your view of the world? You've had such a long and prolific career and you're very well respected and established. And it's almost shocks me that someone of your stature says things that are uh, outside of the mainstream as you do. I mean that as a compliment. Is this something you've always had or is this a newer thing? Well, it, uh, it grew over time because <clears throat> when I started my career, which was 1980, I got my PhD and I became an assistant professor at Harvard University. I can tell you, because I remember it, how proud I was to be an American economist in the world. Uh, you know, I studied international economics, so I was going to go out and solve international problems as an American. And I thought that was pretty cool. My hero intellectually uh, is a well-known, very famous British economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes, I was very deeply influenced, uh, like many in my generation. But I read a lot of Keynes's essays, and I just loved the guy, how intelligent and smart he was and, and decent. And um, he, at the time, was, you know, an economist when Britain was uh, with such power and influence. And I thought, you know, that was interesting because he could get something done that was quite good. And I felt really proud uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be an American at this time when America has this ability to help solve global problems. And here I am starting my career and I'm going to help solve global problems as, as an American economist. And I felt that way for a number of years. But then I saw more and more that I didn't really like. And for me, a big turning point is when I became an advisor, always, by the way, unpaid. I don't do this commercially. You know, I do this as, as a public intellectual, uh, so-called, or uh, as, uh, as an academic. But I became an advisor to Mikhail Gorbachev's economic team. And then I became an advisor to Boris Yeltsin's economic team. And I knew really from Keynes, by the way, that when 
the country that you're trying to help is in really, really deep financial crisis. After all, the whole system had completely collapsed. Then that country needs some help to get back on its feet. And that was really my main message in 1990, 1991, 1992. And I helped Poland get back on its feet economically. And everything I recommended, by the way, they the White House adopted almost right away. And I said, oh, God, good. You know, they, they, they're listening to every word. And then I said the same thing about the Soviet Union with Gorbachev. Zero. Sachs, are you crazy? We're not going to help the Soviet Union. They're our enemy. And then uh, when Soviet Union ended and uh, Yeltsin's economic team asked me to help, I said the same thing about Russia. Again, zero. I thought, that's pretty weird because what I'm recommending for Russia is exactly what I recommended for Poland, and it worked for Poland, and the White House supported what I recommended for Poland, but in the same conditions, it doesn't do it for Russia. I was a little naive, I have to say, because as an economist, I was making economic recommendations, how to help, but I don't think the mood of Rumsfeld and Cheney and others in 1992 was to help. It was, hey, we are the sole world superpower. We get to change everything right now. And then I waited for, with Clinton coming in, no real change. And then on and on. And I began to see that and, and understand better, quite frankly, uh, you know, as you grow up in, in this, because I've really worked all over the world and uh, quite extensively in well over 100 countries. I uh, visited uh, most of the world and know most of the world leaders one way or another, or many, many of them. And I came to understand that the U.S. was a little bit unhinged and that the disasters of the Vietnam War era, which I knew full well because I had marched in the streets against the Vietnam War, and uh, Watergate and the other and the abuses, the Contra wars in Central America. And I also worked in Central America in those years. Um, those were not simply aberrations. Those <laughs> were those were part of the design set. Uh, and. I, you know, you become more sophisticated. You see a lot of lying that, you know, is lying because as I, you know, have become much more, for 20 years, I've been a senior advisor to the United Nations on many things. I see a lot. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I hear a lot. Um, and I don't like it when we're not telling the truth. Uh, and I find it quite dangerous. And I don't like the spin and the narratives. Uh, and I don't like uh, wars that are fought as narratives. I don't like it when uh, we say in our, for some reason, our mainstream media repeat, well, this war was an unprovoked war that started February 24th, 2022. No, uh, there were lots of provocations, and I know some of them firsthand, and I know many, many of them by uh, things that leaders have told me uh, in detail. And I understand the provocations, or today, uh, there's a, a New York Times story uh, about uh, uh, how the Germans connived, let's put it that way, to build the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, with Russia. And uh, yeah, because they wanted uh, natural gas from Russia. The United States opposed that. And uh, I've been saying for months, well, who blew up that pipeline? Uh, the, that would almost surely be the United States. If someone has some other evidence, show me. But otherwise, I know a lot of motivation and capacity that the U.S. did it. And President Biden on February 7th of this year said, if Russia invades, the Nord Stream pipeline is finished. And then the incredulous reporter said, but Mr. President, that's a, a Russian-German pipeline. And the president responded, uh, believe me, we have our ways. And, and so today in the New York Times, they talk about 
Germany and Russia building the pipeline against U.S. opposition. But then when it comes to the paragraph, the short message about the destruction, they say nobody knows who did it. Come on. If you're the New York Times, when I was growing up, the New York Times was looking into Watergate. The New York Times was uh, looking into the lies of the Vietnam War and so on. You know, it had an active view that the government doesn't tell the truth. So you go out to find out what the truth is. Now the New York Times is like, "Mm, suck your thumb. Don't ask anything. Don't ask any question. Don't be curious. We don't know who blew up the pipeline. I'll give another example. You know, Ukraine has been shelling the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Well, maybe it's understandable. They want the power plant back. Russia grabbed the power plant. But it's dangerous to shell a nuclear power plant. In fact, it's reckless to shell a nuclear power plant. So we should be saying to our ally, Ukraine, Don't shell a nuclear power plant. Instead, the New York Times says almost every day, each side accuses the other of shelling the nuclear power plant. Well, I I can tell you and I can tell your listeners because I'm well briefed on it, that Ukraine is shelling the nuclear power plant. Oh, but we're not allowed to say that. Excuse me. We, We can't say that. So this is the problem, Katie. So you asked me how I feel about it. I feel about it that we should tell the truth. Because actually, the world's really complicated. It's really in trouble. And grownups should behave like grownups. That's my bottom line. And there are some interesting recent examples of you telling the truth and the response to you when you tell the truth. Hold on. Let's see. So this is you on Bloomberg television. I remember the moment. <laughs> I'm sure. It's seared in, I'm sure it's seared in your memory. The destruction of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, which I, I would bet was a U.S action perhaps u.s and, and poland uh this is uh, hey, jeff, jeff we gotta stop there that's a that's a quite a statement as well why do you feel yeah, absolutely that that was a u.s action what evidence do you have of that well first of all there's direct radar evidence that u.s uh, helicopters military helicopters that are normally based in gdansk uh, were uh, circling over this area We also had the threats from the United States earlier in this year that one way or another, we are going to end Nord Stream. We also have a remarkable statement by Secretary Blinken last Friday in a press conference. He says, this is also a tremendous opportunity. It's a strange way to, uh, sorry, it's a strange way to talk if you're worried about the piracy on international infrastructure of vital significance. So I know this runs counter to our narrative. It runs, you're not allowed to say these things uh, in, in, uh, in the West. But the fact of the matter is all over the world, when I talk to people, they think the okay. U.S. did it. Professor, just to tell you, well, and, and by, by the way, even reporters on our papers that are involved tell me, Privately, yeah, well, of course, but well, it doesn't show up in our, our media. Professor, I, I don't want to get into the tit for tat about what did or did yeah. not. Was, so that was an interesting response. <laughs> well, it, it was a, a little bit of a funny moment because, you know, usually I'm on that. I'll, I'll probably never be on that show again, right. but I've been on that show many times. And usually they have me on for, you know, two or three of the segments, maybe up to half an hour. And after that, I was off. And then when I was off, one of the anchors, not the two that you saw, but the third one, went after me for five minutes. They did cut off my camera so I could watch on my Zoom. And he just, you know, ad hominem attack for five minutes. And, and you know, of course, I wasn't uh, around to, uh, to to speak about it. To it. Right. But... but This is a problem that it's a game of narratives right now. And we don't need games. We we actually need real discussion of very serious issues before we blow ourselves up by by mistake or Mm. just blunder or misinformation or so many other possibilities. Right. And here's another example of you saying something that people seem uh, a bit uncomfortable with. And this is from the Athens Democracy Forum in October. Yes. 
just playing some of your greatest hits here. The most violent country in the world in the 19th century, by far, was perhaps the most democratic or second most democratic, and that was Britain. You can be democratic at home and ruthlessly imperial abroad. The most violent country in the world since 1950 has been the United States. It's Jeff, been by let's, power involved Jeffrey, in more, stop wait, now. Wait, more let's, wars. Let's, let's, Jeffrey, I, I, I'm, I'm, Jeffrey I'm your moderator, and it's enough. Okay, I'm done. That was another interesting uh, moment. They didn't seem very comfortable with what you were saying. Yeah, you know, the truth is I had talked on a long time, so I probably, oh, okay. talked, probably talked too long, but, but also I should have been allowed to finish the thought. Right. Uh, it, it, it was actually a, a real and serious point that I was making, which is that all my life the U.S. has been in wars and wars of choice and wars that have gone badly, and wars that have inflicted incredible harm on other people and uh, damage to the U.S. and costing trillions of dollars. And we should acknowledge that and understand this. It's a little hard because some of this is so completely underreported. You might think wars would, you know, would have to be reported, but... One example that I know quite a bit about is Syria. Uh, we say that Syria had a civil war or that it had uh, a, uh, a rebellion against Assad in 2011. But what Americans never heard about was the presidential finding by Obama that the CIA should work together with the other countries in the Middle East to overthrow Assad. In other words, this was a regime change operation. And I think regime change operations are awful. Uh, we shouldn't be doing them. Uh, they are incredibly destructive and filled with lies, especially when they're covert, as this one was. And we never discussed the U.S. role in this. Everything was basically the lie that uh, there's an insurrection and we're helping the freedom fighters, not that the United States is actively trying to overthrow a government. And is that right or is that wrong? Is that a decent idea? And one of the things that Putin sees is that the U.S. does that a lot. It shouldn't be a secret, but it's not well understood. Of course, we overthrew Saddam Hussein. We tried to overthrow Assad and failed. We overthrew and basically uh, led to the murder of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. We overthrew the Afghan government. But even more than that, what Americans really don't know and should know is that in 1979, it was the CIA that funded the Mujahideen which was the precursor of al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and all of that. We did that as a lure to try to draw the Soviet Union into a war in Afghanistan. Really a deep, dirty trick that now not only ended up destroying Afghanistan over the course of many decades, but drew the United States into this complete morass for 40 years as well. And then... Putin says, I don't want NATO on my border. And the United States says, oh, why? Don't be paranoid. We're defensive, peace-loving country. You know, when you know a bit, you, you just say, don't put NATO on Russia's border. That's what you know. And if, if we had... If the New York Times were doing its job, which it doesn't do anymore, and if the Washington Post were doing its job, which it doesn't do anymore, and it was giving some context, some background, some history to fill out what these conflicts are about, we wouldn't be stuck in these conflicts. Did, did you play the game of risk 
uh, as as a, the board yeah. game yeah. risk. Okay, so yeah, the board game risk yeah. really is a is a, a marvelous uh, model of uh, how Washington thinking is. You have the map of the world. And the aim of the game is to have your piece on every space of the world. And uh, as you move forward, if you're successful and your your armies are advancing into new territory, every new territory you have has borders with the enemy. And suddenly, every new border becomes the conflict zone. Every new border becomes vital for your national security. And so you have to have every space on the board or suddenly you're at risk. Now, American strategists get this or behave this way. I think it's it's mind boggling because we shouldn't be playing a game of risk where you're trying to conquer the world. But this is the American strategist approach. And a a good example of it is the Solomon Islands, tiny (coughs) islands. 3,200 kilometers off the coast of Australia that uh, had the audacity to sign a security pact with China. And suddenly the United States and Australia are in a tizzy. Uh, How dare they? This is a threat to security. And you hear the voices in the U.S. Congress, you know, uh, completely unacceptable uh, that there's a security pact. because you give China one inch, they'll take the world. But when the United States says, uh, well, NATO should enlarge <laughs> to Georgia and Ukraine, and Russia says, no, that's a security concern, we laugh. We say, why is it a security concern? We're peace loving, we're, we're wonderful, and that's their choice. That's not our choice. We didn't say, well, that's the Solomon Islands choice. We dispatched the deputy of the National Security Council to Asia on an urgent mission to express the U.S. displeasure uh, at the Solomon Islands uh, decision to enter this pact with China. So much, Rob, comes from the unwillingness to really have rules that apply to yourself as well as to others or to think empathetically, what is the other side thinking? And it comes back, by the way, to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think we should talk about that because it's absolutely relevant. When uh, Cuba put, when uh, Khrushchev put the uh, uh, nuclear uh, or the atomic uh, weapons in Cuba, All of Kennedy's advisors, except one, except Adlai Stevenson, said from the start, you must attack and take them out. We need a military operation. Many things can be said about that, but I think the bottom line is it would have started World War III uh, because the CIA had every fact wrong. Uh, It thought that the missiles were not yet operational. It completely underestimated, roughly by a factor of seven, how many Soviet troops were actually in Cuba, how many would be killed uh, in a military uh, operation and so forth. Kennedy did a remarkable thing. He kept asking one question. What is in Khrushchev's mind? What is he thinking? In other words, Kennedy behaved empathetically. Uh, It didn't mean he sympathized with Khrushchev. He was thinking, what is Khrushchev thinking? What is his point of view? Does he want war? Uh, What is he trying to prove? Kennedy had to learn, actually, the details that there were U.S. missiles in Turkey. What are they? Why are they there? Who put them there? And so on. But by uh, the second week of the crisis, Kennedy realized Khrushchev didn't want war, but he did want to put America's face in it, you know, because uh, the U.S. had its uh, uh, Turkish missiles uh, or its missiles in Turkey pointed right uh, on the border of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, The U.S. had invaded Cuba in the Bay of Pigs operation and so forth. Kennedy realized, you know what, we got to get out of this by a compromise. Uh, You remove your missiles. We remove our missiles. We commit never to uh, to uh, invade Cuba again. And 
That's how the crisis was resolved. It wasn't, we demand victory because Khrushchev has done the most dastardly deed, so we must defeat that man, which is the rhetoric that we have today. Uh, it must defeat Putin with his 1,600 active nuclear warheads. We must defeat Putin. This is mind-boggling that even on an anniversary like this, 60 years anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we're not taking care to learn the real lessons of how you diffuse a crisis. And you start with empathy. You say, if we care about the Solomon Islands, hmm, maybe Russia cares about Ukraine and Georgia in the same way. Maybe we shouldn't be quite so provocative. Maybe we shouldn't be talking about humiliating defeat and so forth, or maybe we shouldn't be saying this is the, the worst crime in modern history when the United States is engaged in so many wars of choice. And maybe we should find a way for both sides to stand down. Yeah. Well, I see, uh, I remember reading Daniel Ellsberg's book, The Doomsday Machine. Absolutely. About that there were many nuclear weapons inside of submarines off the coast of Cuba, and we started dropping depth, depth charges on them. And But for, I can't remember the gentleman's name, yeah. who overruled firing the missiles, they were terrified. They're underwater, and the depth charges are going off trying to essentially kill them all and drown them all. Absolutely and, right. And, and this it, guy wouldn't allow the missiles to be shot. But it's that close. That, it's that close to extermination. So re reading list for everybody listening, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, The Doomsday Machine, and mm -hmm. Martin Sherwin, Gambling with Armageddon, which is the yes. finest book ever yes. written about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, yeah. Martin Sherwin tells this story that you're uh, so importantly referring to, Rob, and I think it has many lessons. But what happened is, even after Kennedy and Khrushchev had agreed on the way out, a disabled Soviet submarine in the Caribbean that was out of radio contact, so it had no news, right. was right. disabled, it was overheating, it needed to surface just to breathe. The uh, sailors were uh, fainting, uh, and it right. started to surface, and a jackass in the U.S. Air Force, instead of dropping depth charges, dropped live hand grenades on the submarine as a joke. And he's, you know, we'll scare the hell out of them. So the, uh, the, the uh, commander of the vessel ordered a nuclear-tipped submarine to be put into the, uh, a nuclear-tipped torpedo to be put into the torpedo it's bay true. True. Yeah. and called for its launch. And it happened by coincidence that a Soviet party official, a communist party official, was on that vessel named Antipov. And he had the ability to override the order of the skipper of the uh, of the submarine. And he said, no, yeah. we're going to surface. We're not going to fire this. And under U.S. military doctrine described by uh, Ellsberg and by Sherwin, if the U.S. was attacked by a nuclear weapon, even a nuclear tipped submarine, our military doctrine said we would unleash the full scale response of a complete attack on yes. the Soviet Union, China, and all of the other countries of the Soviet system. And the estimate was 700 million dead. But what they didn't know was about nuclear winter, because such operatus, an attack could yeah. have ended yeah. life, uh, human life on the planet. We came right. within seconds of this. We're stupid yes. if we think that things can't get out of hand. Today, I read about a gen U.S. general saying, well, we may need to uh, break the Soviet blockade of the port uh, of Odessa uh, to let Ukrainian grain supplies. I'm sick of these generals telling us uh, about things that are so unbelievably risky without a proper public debate and understanding because we could end up in nuclear war and 
Mm-hmm. This is uh, mind boggling that we are having generals opine on uh, these kinds of military operations, which would be tantamount to direct U.S. war with Russia in this kind of way. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about the uh, extermination of life on Earth. I mean, these are not rumors. I've seen in Nature and Science magazine studies of what happens to the upper atmosphere if there's a nuclear exchange. And I, I, I encourage many people now, I've been doing a little bit of work with a group called the Quincy Institute, Andrew Basevich. Excellent. And yep. Hart, Hartung in this group, uh, and uh, exploring some of the ramifications for how our military decisions are being made. And it's really quite, it's, it's really quite haunting to try to understand this dynamic as having anything to do with representing the well-being of America or mankind. And I, I learned in, in thinking about American history and politics, which I've been doing pretty much nonstop for 50 years now, uh, it, it turns out the president's main job in the world is to keep a foot on the brake of the U.S. military <laughs> machine. Uh, because uh, it's like those old cars that are poorly tuned that uh, though they're in neutral, they're always revving forward uh, and they're always jumping. You take your foot off the brake, the car jumps forward. And good presidents, great presidents, have been the ones to have the foot on the brake, like Kennedy had the foot on the brake in October uh, 1962. Johnson did not have the foot on the brake and we escalated in Vietnam. Uh, We know that uh, Bush, (laughs) uh, I don't even know if he was in the driver's seat, much less having a foot on the brake, uh, but we went to so many wars. Obama was no good at this either. Uh, So this is a real question. It's a systemic Uh, process. It it is like the game of risk. You're always looking, oh, uh, we're, you know, in Romania and Bulgaria, we're at risk unless we're also in Ukraine. Uh, so we better expand. Well, you know, then there could be uh, uh, losses uh, in the eastern uh, Black Sea and, and the Caucasus. So we better expand to Georgia, et cetera, et cetera, or, or the Solomon Islands or uh, what we're doing uh, in East Asia. And just so much chit chat about war with Taiwan and U.S. war with China and Biden piping off and so forth. All of it is provocative. Uh, All of it requires actually our good luck that a president says, no, we're not going farther. Uh, Korean War, uh, again, uh, had uh, MacArthur had his way, he would have invaded China. Uh, We would have used nuclear weapons at the time. Truman, his, uh, his right decision, no, stop. He had to fire his top general. Uh, this is really the job of uh, of the American president, because the underlying revving machine doesn't have a natural stopping point. Yeah, I remember I had uh, the late Charles Johnson was a good friend of mine, and uh, I was doing a lot of work in Japan at the time. Yeah. But he was working on the books like Blowback. He wrote that trilogy, yeah, about the dangers that foreshadowed the attack of 9-11. Saying exactly. If, you, if, you're, if you're aggressive, you are going to have these consequences putting the American people at risk. But let me, let me shift, Jeff, as we're coming down the home stretch to the relation of all of this to budget and the well-being of America. What concerns me is at the level of medical care, the OECD data shows that America per capita spends more than twice the average in the OECD to have some healthcare system that is ranked 38th in the world by the WHO. The second dimension is we have a baby boom creating a demographic bulge where elder care is going to be a priority. We are going through technological transformation that requires transforming the education system towards knowledge-intensive things. Uh, What was his name? Sir Ken Robinson, the most famous TED Talk of all time. How schools kill creativity. 
we got to change that. That involves investment. Now, we've got this military urge and climate transformation. I guess I worked on the Senate Budget Committee under Pete Domenici, and I'm thinking, how are we going to get all this stuff done if we keep playing these aggressive military games? And how are we going to harness the political economy? I always laughed. Domenici said to me one time, well, you're an economist. You know that thing called Say's Law? I said, yeah. He said, how supply creates its own demand? I said, yes. Yes, Senator. He says, well, you watch. Every year when we put up the budget, about the time that the military budgets come up, you're going to see all kinds of news about how dangerous the world is. They're, they're, creating, they're using fear to create their own demand. And Adam Curtis, the BBC documentary, he created a series, a three-part series that you can watch for free on thoughtmaybe.com. And it's called The Power of Nightmares. And so, Jeff, I'm loading you all up, but you can, you can't sit there and be, uh, how would I say, self-righteous budget hawk, tolerate a military-industrial complex that's spending 22 times what any other country is, neglecting older people, neglecting young people, and letting our health care system cost twice what it should. What... And with all the discord of not reconciling those things, the Bismarck playbook comes back into center stage. Well, you know, one one of uh, the uh, expressions of Joe Biden that I really like, uh, though I haven't heard it from him uh, recently for an obvious reason, uh, he said, don't talk to me about your values. Show me your budget and I'll tell you your values. Uh, and what he what he means by that is where you put your money, that's what counts in the system. Yeah. And the United yes. States uh, has really <clears throat> messed up <clears throat> the budget. It spends far too little on many areas like education, like well-being of children. Uh, it spends far too much on other areas like the so-called modernization of our nuclear uh, fleet uh, arsenal uh, when we should be negotiating uh, long-term uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, and in general, uh, our budget is a mess. Uh, as you say, also, the way we organize key parts of the economy like healthcare is to give private monopolies to a crucial sector ending up overpaying roughly by a factor two for our health care. We spent almost 20% of GDP on health care compared to roughly 10% of GDP in our peer countries. So I've, I've written a number of books, uh, The Price of Civilization, uh, mm -hmm. being one of uh, my favorites, <laughs> about what a budget would look like for a civilized country. And interestingly, I... Uh, and one of the better parts of a speech that uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken just gave about uh, U.S. Uh, approaches to China, he said the real approach is we need to invest in ourselves. We need to strengthen our capacities in science, education, uh, our <laughs> well-being at home, because that's what makes us the competitive model vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, including vis-a-vis -vis China. And uh, that's true. But we're not doing it. And we have lost the budget debate and the budget narrative in the last two years. Biden came in with the idea of a package uh, to build back better. Uh, it did not appear. What happens in the United States is essentially key sectors are in the hands of powerful lobbies. Uh, and military industrial complex is one of them. Big oil is another or fossil fuel industry is another. Uh, the uh, healthcare, private uh, healthcare sector is a third. Those are favored by the budget. Uh, they are favored by regulation. Uh, and areas that don't have <laughs> such powerful lobbies don't see the light of day. And in general, the United States under taxes, even though we're told all the time that we're being crushed by taxes, the total government revenues in the United States 
for federal, state, and local are about 30% of GDP of national income. But in Northern Europe, which ranks much better in healthcare and longevity, uh, in many quality of life <laughs> indicators, about 45% of GDP. Uh, so the fact of the matter is the budget's a mess. And what foundered for Biden in the end, why didn't his package go through? Because nobody wanted to pay for it with taxation. And it all unraveled when uh, Senator Cinema said, I, I don't want to have a rise of the corporate tax rate. And Manchin said, I don't like that billionaire tax. And uh, we ended up with nothing. Uh, Biden ended up empty handed, ineffective politics, by the way. So I, I think a president ought to be able to uh, keep a couple uh, senators uh, uh, in in the fold, and he failed to do so. And that's part of his job also is to know how to twist arms or cajole or uh, give uh, whatever side payments uh, for new projects right. in West Virginia. You get something done, you make a deal. But he, he could not make a deal. He failed on that. So we have nothing. <laughs> so we have a, bu a budget mess. And by the way, a budget mess also with a mountain of debt, uh, now 100% of GDP of public debt, that's actually consequential. With interest rates going up, the burden of that debt is also going to be quite significant. We need to raise some taxes and we need to restructure what we spend, but we're a blocked political system. So uh, we, are, we are not showing uh, a way forward on this and I'm not holding my breath. Nothing's going to happen. Probably the Democrats are going to lose one or both houses of Congress in the fall. If that happens, I, I would guess there would be no significant uh, budgetary reform or action until 2025. So uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of intertwined uh, issues there. And let me start with the, the very specific issue of uh, climate change and the energy transformation that we know we need. <coughs> We need to move to a zero carbon energy system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and that requires actually a lot of long term thinking and a lot of international cooperation. So every day in the context of the Ukraine war, I'm asked by somebody, and it happened again this morning, uh, what's the implication of the war for climate change? In other words, uh, you see Russia um, you know, cutting off or threatening to cut off natural gas to Europe, or Europe putting on sanctions on uh, oil uh, and gas uh, uh, imports from Russia, will this accelerate the energy uh, transition? And the answer is basically no, because uh, it, it may change the calculus uh, in the very short term. It's actually opening up more coal mines again, or uh, pumping more gas and oil to make up for uh, what uh, has been lost from Russian supplies, maybe it by raising the price of uh, oil and gas on world markets, uh, it's making some new solar projects uh, uh, more uh, economical and financeable. But all of that misses the, the main point, which is that the real changes we need are long-term strategic changes in the energy system and that requires a stable, peaceful, cooperative environment, even renewable energy uh, to be efficient and effective needs to cross borders. It needs to be regional, uh, even globally connected in some ways, maybe in the new hydrogen economy. We can't do this if we're in conflict. We won't do this if we're in conflict. So this is the first point that Almost everything of real value for development and what we now call and should call sustainable development, meaning economic development that is also socially just and environmentally sustainable, requires a long perspective. If you have a short perspective because of huge uncertainties, because of war, because of conflict, then you can't accomplish anything real of the transformations that we need. You can improvise, you can uh, maybe uh, keep your footing in the short term, perhaps, 
But the truth of the matter is real development of any kind requires years, even decades of hard, continuous work, educating children, building infrastructure, uh, cooperating across uh, river sheds, uh, uh, building uh, power transmission grids that are, uh, again, transnational. And that is a long-term cooperative effort that depends on peace. And we're not getting there right now, uh, partly because our mindsets really are wrong. Uh, and unfortunately, what I have invade against in the U.S. context is the idea, which is very popular, it's in every speech of U.S. leaders, that the world is safe when the United States leads the world. So primacy, or what the political scientists call hegemony, is really built into the American thinking. I think Henry Luce <laughs> did a, uh, an unfortunate uh, thing to America when he in 1941, christened this as the American century. Uh, you know, it's a great turn of phrase, by the way. So inspiring uh, and uh, so uh, ennobling. But it, it actually basically went to the heads of the permanent state uh, that they took it literally. <laughs> this is our century. You know, in the past, it was Britain's century. Uh, in the industrial age of the 19th century, or it was the Mongol century, or it was the Roman centuries. Now it's our century. Oh, what a dangerous way to think about things because you get way overstretched. Uh, you act provocatively without even attempting to understand the other side. And that, unfortunately, is so much of what happened in uh, Europe after uh, the 19th 90 remarkable transformation. And as you know, I was there. I was physically present in the Kremlin uh, in December uh, 1991. You couldn't even believe, I mean, I could not believe, uh, and especially you'd appreciate it, you know, a kid from Detroit sitting in the Kremlin uh, in this huge office and uh, who walks in the far door, Boris Yeltsin, and he walks across the room uh, and he sat down right in front of me because I was leading the delegation. And he said, gentlemen, because it was all men, he said, gentlemen, in the next room is the leaders of the uh, Soviet military. And I have just agreed with them to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I heard literally those words. Wow. Yeah. Wow is wow, wow is exactly right. It was weird. Point. Huge turning. <laughs> no. So yeah. I thought, and I, I had been working in uh, in the Soviet Union before that. In I was I was told I don't know if it's true that I was the uh, first person to brief the Gosplan leadership in its entirety on the top floor of Gosplan, just outside of Red Square uh, in 1990 uh, to uh, the Politburo leader uh, who headed Gosplan on the transformation to a market economy. And they were taking notes of 50 Soviet leaders on the other side, all with notebooks open, taking copious notes about market uh, economics. But the, uh, the fact of the matter is Gorbachev and Yeltsin wanted a common home. You, Gorbachev, who I regard as the greatest statesman of our age and who's reviled in Russia for having lost the Soviet uh, Union and, and for inflation and everything else, he's the greatest statesman of our age because he understood that what we needed was peace rather than a cold or hot wars. And he was uh, ready to even let the system fall rather than shoot people uh, to, uh, quote, save the old mm -hmm. system. But his idea, which I know, was a common home from Rotterdam to Vladivostok, uh, that we have a common European home. I believed it. Mm -hmm. I went to work uh, for his team in 1991 promoting what we called the, the, the grand bargain, 
working with Graham Allison, who was uh, then head of the Kennedy School at Harvard, and Stanley Fisher and others. And we recommended a significant financial assistance program to the Soviet Union for to support its economic and political reforms. What was the White House response? Complete yet nothing. Nichevo. <laughs> not anything. We're not doing this. Okay. Uh, that uh, uh, was a disaster for, uh, I mean, the, the failure of Western support uh, definitely uh, um, undermined, uh, under, undermined uh, Gorbachev. Uh, Yeltsin emerged uh, after the attempted putsch against uh, Gorbachev, uh, which was in the summer of August uh, 1991. Uh, and then I was contacted by uh, Yeltsin's uh, economic uh, leader, uh, Yegor Gaidar, uh, and I came to Moscow. And Yeltsin said to me uh, and said to others, I want a normal country. I want a democratic country with the market economy, and I want normal relations with the world. I said, absolutely wonderful. <laughs> this is exactly what we want. And, you know, uh, Gaidar, who was uh, then the acting premier of Russia, uh, which was about to become the sovereign country, was meeting with the G7 finance deputies in November 1991. And Russia was running out of foreign exchange reserves. This was a fulminant financial crisis. So I knew a lot about financial crises and their history and their resolution and worked with Poland a couple of years before. And I asked, uh, I suggested to Gaidar, well, look, tell uh, the U.S. and uh, the other six uh, deputy finance ministers, you need a standstill on the debt payments because you're running out of reserves. And uh, Russia is about to become an independent country and we can't have a financial collapse. And he came out of the meeting just absolutely ashen faced. He said they wouldn't even consider it. They said, you have to pay to the penny. Uh, we will not uh, allow anything right now. We're not authorized to allow anything. We will not allow anything. You continue to pay. Russia ran out of reserves at the beginning of 1992 as Yeltsin came to power. In other words, a fulminant financial crisis. I couldn't believe it. I spent two unbelievably frustrating years trying to get the U.S. and the IMF to do something. And they wouldn't do anything. And uh, Larry Eagleberger, who was acting secretary of state, explained to me at one point, said, Mr. Sachs, it's not even about what you're advising. Even if I agreed with it, it's not going to happen. And he said, you know, this is an election year. It's not going to happen. And the truth is, you know, this this didn't determine all the future. But God, did it show an attitude of obtuseness in the United States. And I didn't appreciate then that. Cheney and Wolfowitz were working on their great neocon uh, illusions that now we're the sole superpower. Now we get to do what we want. And they really were working on the next wars because they were going to take away every Soviet ally or Russian ally in the Middle East, knock out uh, Libya, Syria, uh, Iraq. This was a plan already from the early 1990s, according to oh, yeah. Wesley Smith. Oh, yeah. And, and, uh, I didn't know it at the time. I just couldn't believe here we are, this historic moment, a chance to cooperate. Uh, and uh, no, we're not going to cooperate. We're going to be the sole superpower. And yeah. I just found that obtuseness year after year from the U.S. And by the end of the 1990s, <laughs> I basically had had it because I had seen the U.S. now from all sides I had seen it from the Latin American perspective. I had seen it from the Central European perspective. I had seen it from the Russian perspective. I had seen it from the Indonesian perspective in 1997. We just were not a cooperative country that aimed to work with other countries to solve problems. We were the unipolar great power of the world. 
we were arrogant uh, and we were not paying attention to what other countries said. And this manifested itself in a number of financial debacles of these countries that uh, had big effects on the world. It also manifested in what brings us to the war in Ukraine today, though this is a very unpopular view. It's right. And that is NATO enlargement. What John Mearsheimer has said is right. Kissinger said it. Uh, and so many other wise people, George Kennan said it in 1997, don't do this NATO enlargement. It'll lead to a new Cold War. Uh, now we have a hot war. Uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, under Clinton was deciding whether to resign or not when he uh, learned that Clinton indeed would go ahead with NATO enlargement because Bill Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, said, look, we're, we're starting to improve relations with Russia. Do we really need to risk that right now? by peremptory moves of NATO enlargement, especially since unequivocally uh, both the Germans and the Americans had promised Gorbachev and then Yeltsin no enlargement in uh, return for uh, German reunification. Then we lied about it. Well, it's not in writing. We brought out all our lawyers, but good historians know uh, that those commitments were made and we just want to deny that. And given, you know, the predominance of uh, U.S. government in our media, you can tell any story you want. This is absolutely, yeah. uh, absolutely true. But the long and the short of it, Rob, is that um, NATO enlargement started. We weren't giving any financial help. We were plotting wars against Saddam Hussein. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Assad, all the allies of the former Soviet Union uh, or of the Soviet Union and, and then of Russia. Uh, Russia has military uh, naval base uh, in uh, in Syria. So Assad was would be our target and so forth. No cooperation other than superficial. And in the 1990s, the NATO enlargement started. And then during George W. Bush, well, actually, Clinton did something that, you know, in, in retrospect, we didn't even see the significance of, but it was hugely significant and misguided. Uh, and that was uh, the war against Serbia in 1999 uh, to uh, force Serbia to give up Kosovo. Uh, so there was a rebellion of the uh, Kosovar uh, Albanians or Albanian Kosovars, I should say. Uh, in Serbia, and the U.S. took sides and said, let them break away. Uh, and when Serbia said, no, they're part of Serbia, which is the normal way that diplomacy works, uh, the U.S. bombed uh, Belgrade for several weeks. And we set up the precedent that uh, if you want a breakaway state or you want to weaken the other side, just go bomb them. Uh, and then when Russia says, well, when we do this, uh, you know, we're called the crime of humanity, but when NATO does it, uh, that passes as uh, defending freedom fighters. So isn't there no standard or a double standard? But just to carry on to the, the current day, in the early 2000s, after the Belgrade bombing, uh, and then after 9-11, of course, Bush pushed the enlargement of NATO to uh, I think seven countries under his watch, an extraordinary uh, increase of the number of countries. The Baltic states, uh, to begin with, the Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Slovenia, if I remember correctly, all during Bush's watch. And then to the shock of the Europeans in NATO in 2008, he said uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. And just take a look at a map, uh, and I encourage everybody to take a look at the map of the Black Sea. What was NATO's idea? What was the U.S. strategic idea? The U.S. strategic idea was basically to own the Black Sea for NATO, because you'd have Turkey, Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, 
And where's Georgia? All the way over on the yeah. eastern side of the Black Sea suddenly is going to be a NATO country, whereas NATO was originally to defend against an invasion by a now defunct, non-existent country in Western Europe. So suddenly it is an expansionary force moving straight across the Black Sea. It reminds me a lot of the Crimean War of the 19th century. Who controls the Black Sea? And well, one thing has led to another, and we have the war in Ukraine. And if in our media you say, you know, the United States played a provocative war, you're immediately targeted. Oh, you're you're just purveying Putin's propaganda. Well, this is really nonsense. We need a serious discussion, some context, some history. And we should not have pushed NATO right up against Russia's edge and right around the encirclement of the Black Sea. But we did so. And uh, now we're uh, also paying consequences for this, but especially Ukraine is paying consequences for this.